Okay, very good morning to you. It's Thursday, the 17th of June. I hope you're doing well. And thank you very much for everyone who joined me on the YouTube channel last night. I hope that was a, a useful live session. Um, and all we need to do is go back and go onto the categories of Amplify Live videos, and you'll be able to see that recording if you want to go back and review the event as it unfolded. But what I wanted to use today's uh, briefing for really was a, a bit of a debrief of what exactly happened, looking at the main points of why the market had this hawkish reaction. And as you would well know by now, that being high yields, pressing T notes lower, weighing on gold as the dollar spiked higher, pushing major currency pairs lower in euro dollar and cable, and stocks also coming under a bit of pressure. At the close, the cash markets Dow down about seven tenths of one percent, S and P a half, then Nasdaq was down about a third of one percent. So percentage change, not a massive move, but certainly there were some surprises in last night's uh, announcement for sure. Um, just quickly before we get into that, an, an overview of sentiment this morning. And as I said, I'm not going to go into the charts from a technical perspective. I'll let Tim and the Amplify Live community on the the private Discord feed go into that, but. Um, we are keeping uh, an eye at the moment on these dollar-based pairs because we are retesting the low that held during the Asia PAC session at the moment in the lights of the euro and close proximity to that also in cable. Uh, gold is also top right, just started to drift down a little bit and breaking through that APAC low. Um, we are approximately still a good 10 bucks away from the initial spike low that we saw in the aftermath of the Fed. Uh, but certainly, uh, definitely from a technical point of view, there is some scope for, for move low, moves lower. Uh, and beyond that point, the $1,800 handle has acted as a significant point on the daily chart of technical support if we were to trade heavy throughout the session. From the equity indices, um, definitely yeah, a negative reaction, perhaps a little bit more controlled. Um, definitely a more pronounced move, as we'll look at in the US 10 year in the currency markets than that of equities um, in terms of the actual uh, size of movement. But what I wanted to do is just have a look on the, the daily chart for both the S&P and NASDAQ. The NASDAQ basically is a reflection of this same kind of setup, which is, for me, we're trading at around 4,200 in the S&P. Um, there's been such a good level of support of 41.80 and a half, which has been that previous top uh, for a majority of maids flipped to support through late, late of that month and then early June. So for me, I think there's there's definitely room for downside given the hawkish surprise for, for the Fed. But in actuality, I mean, if you actually look where equities are and, uh, and actually what's developed, I mean, we're still very elevated. So you know, if we did move lower, I don't think that particularly is necessarily um, time to call it quits on, on equity markets just yet. But uh, definitely, I think from a technical perspective, there's there's a little bit of room perhaps for a bit more downside to materialize before finding a bit of uh, footing. Uh, and perhaps we'll see that materialize as we go into the US session um, later on today. The NASDAQ, as I said, is, is fairly similar in to that degree. Um, just looking here, Kind of similar in the sense of 13,737 is that same kind of May, June area, that inflection point for price. And so you can see here there is there's plenty of room on the downside until we get back down to that kind of zone of what I see as kind of more uh, firmer support in that regard. In the intraday space, um, targeting obviously on the downside, the initial lows that were seen both in the aftermath and in the Asia Pac session. Um, of the FMC announcement and then near term below the S1 today on the daily pivots that uh, horizontal support level seen around the 13,800 mark as well uh, as, as more near term uh, levels to watch. The US 10 year perhaps was the most telling of a narrative uh, if that makes sense and what I mean by that is on the left hand side here was the spike higher that we saw on the release of the last non-farm payrolls report which came out in excess of 500,000 jobs, but um, obviously in combination with the, the payroll report prior to that being a, a large disappointment, the fact that jobs have just not kept pace and the fact that even though inflation was high, people were still looking through it in terms of the price pressures being somewhat transitory. And um, last week was really, uh, and, and really since June, we've seen a pretty consistent decline in US yields, which has led the 10 year all the way up uh, north of the 133 handle. And then basically, there was a little bit of kind of 
profit taking on that bit of position squaring going into the Fed event because we knew it was going to be a particularly important one. And then obviously they came out and as we'll discuss, shocked the market with the dot plots for 2023 anticipating two rate hikes and prices immediately moved uh, sharply lower. And as we'll go through some of the main comments, comments on inflation as well, bumped us lower again. But the point being, it's interesting where we are trading right now, which is 131.18. And of course, that is absolutely flat to where we were prior to that move. So I think a little bit of context is quite key because what tends to happen uh, in a situation like this is that you can kind of let your let your mind run away with yourself that all of a sudden the Fed are going to start hiking rates. That's That's certainly not what they said. Um, it's just as a function of market positioning, certainly the, the T-note move was, was pretty uh, pronounced in that respect. But as I said, let's use this as a bit of a debrief session. So what was the main thing? And the main thing of definitely was that initial snap comment. If you go back on the recording, you'll probably hear me getting a little bit excited because it was quite an obvious thing to see straight off um, if you're looking at the kind of major news wires. And it was the fact, of course, that they anticipate two interest rate increases by the end of 2023. Now, to put that in context, I would say on the balance, in terms of the banks on the street, probably the expectation was for one rate hike. So that would be a movement. Let me just put this into a graphical form for you. So this is the June dot plot for rates on the top and the March projections down at the bottom. So what we were looking at really is the the composition of dots moving from point A here up here to point B. An actuality that then resulted in a move of interest rates seen at the end of 2023 on a median basis at 0.6%, which would constitute two interest rate hikes from where we're at at the moment in the federal funds rate. Uh, and as I said, most were only looking for one, but the rest then weren't looking for two, they were looking for none. So this definitely was a big surprise for markets and hence the reason why there was an immediate and the most aggressive move was seen on that first flash of that, that headline. This was certainly much more hawkish to bump that up to the point of where they'd see two rate hikes. Important though to, to also cover that Jerome Powell did go on to say, and obviously there's a press conference that followed the initial statement and all the projections, that discussing liftoff now would be highly premature and the dots are not a great forecaster of future rate moves. He definitely is right. The dots have been questioned many times in the recent past about their validity because you know the market assigns so much priority to the composition of these dots and that trajectory of the green line and the median uh, dot plot. But in reality, very rarely are they accurate because what you're trying to ask the central bankers to do basically is forecast where interest rates are going to be at a period quite far in the future, two years and beyond. So the fact that them being accurate is pretty much impossible to that degree. But obviously, we know this is kind of a channel of forward focus. But for me, it's kind of that's a bit of um, management on the behalf of Powell there. So he knows for sure that a two rate hike 2023 change is going to spook the market. He would have known that before even the market moved. And so coming out and saying, look, discussing liftoff is totally premature and it definitely is premature. You know, we're talking about rates rising twice in two years time. So I think that warrants a bit of, of control in that respect. And then also him highlighting the fact that the dots are not a great forecast. It's almost kind of um, cutting off his own nose to spite his face a little bit because it's his tool, but he's trying to use it to water down then the hawkish impact of what he's trying to convey. So things are improving. It constitutes rates a little higher in the future. That isn't going to change the near term. And so He's just trying to reassure the market with what otherwise is a more hawkish change, I think, in the in the dot plot in that respect. The other things he said that I thought were very important um, were, well, I'm going to leave it on this shot for now. He The comment on inflation. So there was really two legs to the move um, yesterday, and they were both in the same direction in a hawkish manner. So the, the two rate one um, indicative of 2023 was one. The second one was Powell said bottleneck effects putting upward pressure on inflation have been larger than anticipated and inflation could turn out to be more persistent 
than they expect. That was when we got another push in the same direction um, as the press conference got underway. And so this is that kind of admission that, yeah, inflation, perhaps we misjudged it. It's a little bit more punchy than we thought. It's going to be a little bit more sticky than we thought. Uh, and the market, again, took that as another signal to carry on some of those initial moves. Those two parts were definitely the standout uh, in my mind to take away. The other thing then is uh, the actual summary of economic projections. And we were anticipating movement here, particularly in GDP, but the PC inflation number was also going to be key. Now, for GDP, they upgraded that from 6.5 to 7%. The rest remains largely unaltered, but a little bit higher perhaps in 2023. And again, somewhat then uh, constituting the rationale behind why they would see rates higher um, at that point. But the PC inflation one was was quite meaningful. They obviously have seen a significant upgrade here of a full percentage point from 2.4 to 3.4. But what I did think was interesting at the time was that, to me, it's still kind of saying that inflation is transitory. My personal take here is that they have um, admitted to the fact that inflation is a little bit more um, stronger than what they thought, and it might um, stay around for a little bit longer, a few more months than they anticipated. But if you actually look at these forecasts for PC inflation in 2022, this is the end of 2022, it's basically unaltered. Okay, it's 0.1 up from March to June, but that's, that's minimal. So they see a big increase to the near-term inflationary pressures, but they still see it pretty much easing off as they previously did do. So it's still, to me, um, is, to, is a, a buy-in to the idea of, of transitory inflation uh, in that respect. Obviously, that was the big figure down here at the bottom. So in reality, for anyone not used to kind of monitoring this stuff in real time, that would be one of the main first headlines that you would see on the Bloomberg or the Reuters kind of ticker tape that would stick there as a main highlighted headline. Um, the 0.6 is, is definitely a, a large um, jump from where we were, obviously at, at point 0.1. The other things then to be aware of was this conversation piece around tapering that was obviously the other kind of sweet spot we were looking for and he said literally we are talking about talking about tapering so as much as that was kind of coined as a bit of a joke that that's kind of the, the phrasing that actually was the phrase that he used when asked about tapering uh, have made progress but still are ways to go he said um, it will be appropriate to consider a plan for tapering at the coming meetings if progress continues we will, we will give advanced notice before taper announcement and provide as much clarity as we can. So that latter part's very important. That's that kind of notice and that's that general timing the market consensus is at the moment is the notice will come at Jackson Hole in 10, 11 weeks time at the end of August. That will then be formalized in September, which then gives the market three or four months, perhaps longer to readjust then to then see tapering actually physically commencing and the reduction of bond buying into Q1, let's say, of 2022. So on the tapering side, there definitely wasn't any hawkish shock there. That's pretty much what we were anticipating. And, and so again, in summary, it was really the two interest rate hike in 2023 and the comments particularly on inflation uh, that were most, most meaningful. When I do look at the charts though this morning, and, and I'm really looking forward to uh, the podcast that we put out every every Friday, the Market Watch podcast. Just check it out if you haven't already done so on Apple or Spotify. But it's when I have a pretty informal conversation, a bit of a chin wag with the head of trading peers, really keen to get his take on, on what we've had here. Because to me, in the near term, I'm not sure if I personally see this as too destabilizing for markets um, after what we had yesterday. And my, my general rationale there really is that you know, rate, rates rising a little bit more than what we previously thought because we did think they were going to go up at least once in 2023 generally. Now it's two. That doesn't really change the near-term picture on the timing of tapering, which I think is quite key really for the short term or short to medium term. And so it doesn't alter the fact that the August set kind of Q1 2022 timeline remains somewhat intact and for me, then, that is a supporting hand in combination with the fact that the Fed, to me, from the from data on the dot plots, quite clearly see inflation still being transitory, albeit 
around for a little bit longer than perhaps they previously thought. Uh, but we'll get his take on Friday. A couple of banks have commented, and Goldman Sachs basically said they continue to forecast broad dollar weakness driven by the currency's high valuation and a broadening global economic recovery, but more hawkish Fed expectations and the ongoing tapering debate look likely to be a headwind to the dollar shorts over the near term. Um, Deutsche Bank kind of adding similar types of views. There's now a greater scope for front-end real rate repricing in the US yield curve and also room for higher volatility. Both factors are bullish for the dollar, he said, uh, their, their economist, that support for the Fed was providing euro dollar upside is no longer there. Um, so, you know, take it as you will. What I, what I would say is what I generally do or try to do is that after, a day after an event like that, you know, if you go on to Bloomberg, Reuters, Zero Hedge, all these types of things, just try and read what other banks are saying. Um, you know, you don't have to be this, this kind of market wizard trying to calculate and work out, you know, your own unique view. What's quite a healthy exercise I always find is, um, you know, construct your own thoughts, but also read what others are saying. And just get a general vibe for what the consensus estimate or what the consensus view is on the situation um, and the kind of rationale behind how they've drawn those conclusions. And generally, I find that a pretty healthy exercise then for giving me a fairly balanced view without imparting too much of my own kind of preference. Because I do feel from a, from a Fed perspective, I do have the self-awareness at least to understand that I definitely sit on the more dovish side if I was a, uh, a central banker uh, and, and I kind of base that on the fact that the Fed have always been relatively cautious and so that's why um, the market reacted like it did yesterday I think most people kind of see it like that in terms of the Yellen Powell approach and so yesterday was quite a surprise but yeah I'm uh, th th what I'm saying is have those views but try to then kind of broaden out your your thinking and, and obviously um, stress test it by understanding what other large financial institutions are looking at. All right, um, quick whip through of some other news. Um, the Aussie has seen a little bit of a bid overnight, but it's really, in honesty, it's failed to sustain that recovery amid come sort of the ongoing dollar strength at the moment. But Australia's unemployment rate tumbled uh, overnight. In fact, this is a, a quick look at the Australian unemployment rate. And as you can see here, it's back to pre-pandemic levels already. So comparative to, say, the US and other places, the Australian jobs market is right back uh, into play again. Um, so their unemployment rate overnight came in at 5.1%. Expectations were for 5.5%. Um, in fact, Australian jobless rate has fallen for seven consecutive months. And so the RBA... Their kind of expectations have increased now that the RBA, the central bank, will not extend the time on, timeline on the bank's yield control measures next month, which is one of their own unique ways in order to control the yield curve to support and stimulate the economy through the last um, 15 months or so. Um, so as I said, a little bit of Aussie appreciation at the point of release, but it's failed to really sustain that as all these currencies are trying to tackle the kind of uh, galvanized US dollar at the moment. The other thing I wanted to mention, it's not really so much of a talking point at the moment, but warrants putting on your, literally on your radar, um, because there is a disturbance being highlighted as a weather pattern um, that's in close proximity to the Gulf of Mexico. And in fact, the National Hurricane Center have said the Gulf of Mexico has a 90% chance of a tropical cyclone formation over the next five days with a tropical depression likely by late Thursday or Friday when the low moves across the western part of the Gulf of Mexico. So obviously very strategically important here for um, oil, well, gas, refinery operations um, in the Gulf of Mexico. So it does it is worth keeping an eye on but in all honesty i think we're not seeing any real reaction in energy prices at the moment i wouldn't anticipate we would not unless this weather pattern starts to intensify beyond what is being calculated at the moment it needs to get up there into category hurricane status 
uh, to really start influencing things. At the moment, it doesn't look like that's the case, but there's still some time to run. Uh, at this point, it is going to strengthen, um, so it's worth keeping an eye on on the National Hurricane Center site. All right, in terms of the day, what have we got? Um, you've got the SMB rate decision at 8.30, the Weijin rates at 9. I'm not going to go into too much of that because I know a lot of you don't trade those, those particular currencies. So you've got the final HICP number at 10 for the Eurozone. Again, final reading, so not looking for any real market move on the back of that. So this morning really is about digestion of what's happened yesterday. Uh, and, and I think the market's going to take a bit of time to really draw its own conclusion at this point. So I wouldn't get too aggressive not unless you start to see kind of technical breakouts. Uh, and then this afternoon, jobless claims anticipated to continue the positive trend of late, so decreasing to 359,000 from 376. Um, and you've got Philly Fed also, both figures coming out at 130. Speaker-wise, you've got the chief economist of the ECB at 130. Uh, you've also got Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary. She is speaking as well today. Let me just remind myself on my notes. Um, I believe she's giving a testimony to uh, the House panel on the federal budget today. Wouldn't be, again, expecting much in the way of any market move on the back of that. Uh, but you know, just so you're aware, she has been making quite a lot of comments of late about China specifically, uh, but also on the coattails of the Fed, You know, perhaps just keeping on your radar that she is speaking today. Uh, she could say something. Supply-wise, um, coming out... <laughs> Five, six billion coming out of Spain, nine to 10 billion out of France for any fixed income traders, a two, five, seven note and a two year uh, floating rate note auction announcement of sizes at 4 p.m. with a 16 billion five year tips auction at 6 p.m. And that is it. Going to leave it there. <coughs> Excuse me. Feel free to um, drop me a, a comment if there's any questions and I'll see the rest of the community online on Amplify Live. All right. Take care. Have a good day.